is the first war in the United States history where there's a lot of photographs taken. And the photographs are going to really impact the way that people think about the war that weren't necessarily here on the battlefield. But there are a number of very powerful photographs of just dead bodies laying around uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg. Think about, for example, uh, Vietnam. How did, how did the images of Vietnam affect the way that America dealt with, with that war? There you go. It came into their houses through the news reports and that sort of thing. How about the interesting one, World War II. There were also some images that were brought back to the United States. Where were they played mostly? Do you remember? In the movie theaters. You've heard of, have you ever heard of newsreels? Yes. Just before you saw a movie, you would watch a newsreel about a battle or something that happened in the war. And how did those affect? You know how those affected? Uh, those raised money. The, the, so they were positive images, right? Okay. How is that different than what happened with the Vietnam? the images that came from Vietnam. Uh -huh. So that phenomenon starts here with the Civil War, with these images that Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner and others have taken. And this is one of the more famous places where a, a photo was shot. All Americans before, so well, a lot there of them, was a lot of them were related. A lot of them didn't even want to kill each other. I mean, when you think about it, there's I'm big into yeah. weapons, military yeah. history, and weapons, and there's a lot of them. They talk about finding muskets on the battlefield that were loaded four and five times because they didn't want to be the guy that you know didn't look like they were shooting. So when everybody would fire, they just drop another shot in there, load it back up. I mean, these people didn't want to shoot at each other. And I, I know, but I think there's some truth to the fact that these guys had some sense of sympathy for each other, individually speaking. Individual. Almost like at the end of a ball game when you shake hands yeah. with the other guy. Like, good job. They no. say, but you, but you still fight hard. It was very Victorian. I, I'm in Donald Kong Sioux then. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Donald Kong Sioux. I will step on you after the play. I, I will <laughs> step, buddy. I agree with you. That's wrong. With the entire Irish Brigade right in this field behind you, we're talking thousands of men all at one time, had them get down on their knees and he gave them what's called conditional absolution, which means you are forgiven as long as you're not a coward, right? If, if you're a coward, then you'll go to hell. But as long as, you're, um, as long as you do your duty and whatnot and you die today, I, I am using my authority as a representative of the church uh, to assure you your place in heaven. Uh, so he's giving absolution. He's giving what's called conditional absolution. And then, the, as the Protestants tell it, they said, what the heck, let's do it too. And they, the Protestant, even some of the Protestants in the brigade knelt down and crossed themselves and accepted uh, his absolution on that afternoon. Abraham Bryan's house. Uh, it's kind of a unique site. He was uh, one of several free black farmers. And you can see it's right in the middle of Pickett's Charge. Uh, he got out of town as he, as he heard the Confederates were coming. Uh, when he came back, he asked the government, he said, you know, you guys trampled my crops. You destroyed my home. So he asked the government for some money. He asked for a little over $1,000. I think it was like $1,028. They gave him 15 uh, he ends up actually reburying Union soldiers for a buck a body. So he, was, he got a dollar for every Union soldier that uh, he buried. No, I don't think too many girls, probably none as far as I know, died in this charge has something to do with a couple of technological issues. One is a technological advance and one is a technological um, lack of advance, I should call it. The first is this. The muskets that were being used, you know, prior to, particularly the revolution and beyond, were what they call smooth bore muskets. 
that means the inside of the uh, m uh, muzzle, the barrel, was, was smooth, which meant it was kicking out what we call a knuckleball. You all know how what a knuckleball does? What does it do? How does it come out? Well, there's no rotation. It has no predictability, right? It kind of does something like that, right? Right? What was the Civil War all about? Why was why were they fighting? The election of Abraham Lincoln. If we remove slavery from the whole mix, is there still a civil war? You say no, right? So then that seems to me that you're saying slavery is the issue. Look, you can spin it. You can spin it. And there were other reasons. I don't think it was slavery. You take, like you just said, you take slavery out. And I just don't see these people running through this field right here. Trying to get cultural approach is a relationship between geography and history. And I don't think there's any place in the United States where that comes to, to uh, manifestation as much as it does right where you're standing, where you're sitting. You can see, as much as I can tell you in a class, as much as you can read in a book, that the high ground is going to be important for the Battle of Gettysburg. You don't grasp it until you stand here and look down on this field and say, Doug on it, the high ground's pretty darn important for winning this battle. And so this is the essential piece of property on July 2nd for winning or losing the Battle of Gettysburg. We're on the top of Little Round Top. Now let me say a couple words about the tower. One is, for me, it's a little bit of a workout to go up, so you, I have to take my time getting up. When you get to the top, you start to slow down just a little bit. Matter of fact, uh, you know, some people have had some hard times. That, this was built in, in the 1890s. It was built in the 1890s. It's a, it feels a little rickety as you get to the top, but my sense is, is if it hasn't come down 120 years, I doubt it's gonna come down at this point. It's not, <laughs> you know. So let's go to the top, and when we get up there, you'll really get a sense of, of the whole landscape, and we'll talk about what we're gonna do today. You think of Pickett's Charge, you think of the 15,000 men who came across that field and got slaughtered right up there by the Pennsylvania Monument. Oh, one of the things I thought was really beneficial about this trip was that uh, we were able to, uh, as educators, acquire a lot of uh, resources that we're able to immediately take back into our classrooms for those of us that are, are already teachers. So uh, you know, even beginning, say, tomorrow, I'll be able to start integrating, say, the cultural approach. Being, being here in Gettysburg, um, it really it really ties everything together. The, the six aspects of the cultural approach, unlike a textbook could do uh, for me personally, uh, being here, seeing it, it tied the religious um, aspect and, and the political. It, all six came together, and I could actually visualize it. Uh, I found out before coming here that one of my ancestors fought in uh, Devil's Den, and actually standing on Devil's Den, where very easily he might have stood and got, got wounded himself, was a really awesome experience. Just mm. have a world